out of this, sometimes we're left to wonder, is there anyone who's really interested in peace and righteousness and justice just for the sake of peace, righteousness, and justice? Or are most people interested in peace in as much as it um, takes care of their self-interest? Do you kind of get where I'm going? Mm -hmm. Do we want righteousness and justice and peace because that's what we really want? Or are they are they couched under and and what's really at a base of some of that sometimes? I'm just trying to secure my own personal situation. Um, I want you to think about that as we go through Isaiah tonight, uh, chapters, chapter 8 and 9. Um, I want us to recap chapter 7 just to talk about it just for a minute. And then we'll, we'll actually read chapter 8, uh, 1 through 7 uh, quickly here in just a moment. So Ahaz is now the king of Judah. Um, you remember from last week, Judah has been attacked by Israel, and Judah has been attacked by Syria. And now it appears that Israel and Syria are joining forces to go after Judah. They're going after Judah for one of two reasons. They're either going to just defeat them and decimate them and plunder, or they are going after them to try to force them into servitude so that they can ally themselves with Israel and Syria because us Syria is warming up in the bullpen and about to be a threat to everybody. All right? So that's kind of what's going on. Ahaz, when he sees the situation, he considers trying to take the preemptive mood move of aligning himself with Assyria and hoping that if he lines, aligns himself with Assyria, he will have the strength that he needs to deal with Israel and Syria as they come after him. God is telling him through Isaiah, don't go there. Don't trust Assyria. Trust me. Trust God. You don't need any kind of other ally. And the, the fact of it is, if, if you don't stand firm in me, eventually you're going to fall. So he says, Ahaz, um, to prove myself to you, um, ask for a sign, anything. Anything you want to ask, I'll, I'll do it to prove who I am. Ahaz says, I will not test the Lord. He's couching is what he's really doing. Um, he, Ahaz does not want to ask for a sign because if he knows if he asks for a sign, God will grant the sign. And that means Ahaz probably has to do what God wants him to do, and he doesn't get to do what he wants to do. So Ahaz says, no, I'm not seeking a sign. God says, I'm sending one anyway. And he will be called what? Emmanuel. God with, with us. Okay. So I want you to keep peace and God with us. Just, just put that over here and see how many times we come back to that connection uh, before we're done tonight. So God says this virgin or young woman of marriageable age, we talked about last week how those are basically the same thing, will give birth to a son. His title will be Emmanuel, God with us. So God is promising his presence with Judah. The rest of chapter 7 is the warning of what life is going to be like if you don't choose God. Because there's a warning coming that, hey, don't, don't, make, don't make your bed with Assyria. You're going to be sorry you did. Okay. That brings us to chapter 8, and I promise we're going to do chapter 8 kind of quickly because I want us to spend most of our time on chapter 9. But uh, can I have somebody read for us the first seven verses of Isaiah 8? Actually, the first eight verses, I'm sorry. Isaiah 8, verse 8. I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks. And actually, let's just go to seven. I, I read my notes wrong. Let's just go to seven. Seven, the first eight verses? Yes. First, uh, eight, the first seven verses. Seven. seven. Chapter eight. Chapter eight. eight. First seven. That, that's, that's my fault. Uh, no problem. Okay. 
All right, eight, first seven verses. Yes. All right. The Lord said to me, take a large scroll and write on it with an ordinary pen, <laughs> Mayor Shalal Hash Baz. Sound the hard word, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so I called in Uriah the priest, and Zechariah, son of Jerob, of Jerorekiah as reliable witnesses for me. Then I made love to the prophetess, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said to me, Name him Meher Shalal Hashbaz. For before the boy knows how to say my father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the plunder of Samaria will be carried off by the king of Assyria. The Lord spoke to me again. Because this people has rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh and rejoices over Rezin and the son of Remaliah, therefore the Lord is about to bring against them the mighty floodwaters of the Euphrates, the king of Assyria, with all of his pomp. It will overflow all its channels and run over all of its banks. Okay, this is the uh, this is the first fulfillment of Isaiah 4, 7, 14. This is the immediate fulfillment, not the long-term one, but the immediate fulfillment. Isaiah, uh, Isaiah's first wife dies. Isaiah uh, remarries. This prophetess gives birth, and her name is exactly what Jack pronounced. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and before this boy is even able to communicate before he can even communicate Damascus is destroyed and then King Rezin of Syria and King Pekah of Israel both die in 732 by the time this boy reaches puberty Israel will have already long been destroyed so the initial prophecy is fulfilled right here now, here's where we go to the next level, because when we get to the end of this chapter, it, it's kind of like you're watching a late night infomercial when someone says, but wait, there's more, <laughs> because we're about to hit the more, because Ahaz has made the wrong choice. He chose Ahaz, and, or Ahaz chose Assyria instead of trusting God. And as a result, we're going to see what he talks about in verse 7, because of what he's done, he the mouth that he decided to feed in Assyria is going to bite it. Okay? All right, now, verse 8. Sweep on into Judah, swirling over it, pass through it, reaching up to the neck. Its outspread wings will cover the breadth of your land. What's the next word? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. That's not what we normally think about when we see God with us. Let's keep reading. Raise the war cry, you nations, and be shattered. Listen, all you distant lands, prepare for battle and be shattered. Prepare for battle and be shattered. Devise your strategy, but it will be thwarted. Propose your plan for but it will not stand for, what's the next words? God, God it is us. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. This is not where we expected Emmanuel to show up tonight. So this is what the Lord says to me with a strong hand upon me, verse 11, warning me not to follow the way of the people. Do not call conspiracy anything this people calls a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. Do not dread what <coughs> the Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. He will be a holy place, both for Israel and Judah. Now watch this. He will be a stone that causes people to stumble, a rock that makes them fall. Who's going to do that? God. God with us? It's going to make cause for stumbling. For the people of Jerusalem, he'll be a snare. Many of them will stumble, they'll fall, they'll be broken, they'll be snared, and they'll be captured. 
Then uh, Isaiah is told to bind up this testimony of warning, seal up God's instruction among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the descendants of Jacob, yet I will put my trust in him. Here am I and the children the Lord has given me. We are signs and symbols of Israel from the Lord Almighty who dwells on Mount Zion. All right. Emmanuel, God with us, means God's going to be with us whether we want him to be with us or not. Okay? God is going to, on some level, he's going to be with us whether we choose him or we reject him. If we reject him, he becomes a stumbling block. If we receive him, he becomes our sanctuary. Because he's the God who was always present. Okay? But he will either be a stumbling block or he will be a sanctuary. We know that to be true. Those who make a place for him find in their lives find him to be the glue that makes everything make sense and hold it together. Those who ignore him spend their whole life trying to figure out what's wrong. Something's just, something's just not working. We know. They left out what is the most critical equation in their lives. And if you leave out what's most critical, nothing else is going to work. Nothing else is going to be in balance. So he finishes this in verse 19. He says, when someone tells you to consult mediums and spirits, you'd rather consult dead people than God. You'd rather consult dead people than the Torah. People don't do that anymore, right? Mm. But we're past mm. that point, right? When someone tells you to consult medium and spiritist who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Don't you kind of feel almost like a verbal smackdown? Why would you consult the dead on behalf of the li- Consult God's instruction and testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they'll roam through the land. When they're famished, they'll become enraged. Looking upward, they will curse their king and their God. Yeah. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. They'll be thrust into outer darkness. They'll never figure it out. Because God is not with them. Anything they put in the place of God is going to crumble. Anything they put in the place of God is going to fail. You get what God is trying to to get their attention through Isaiah in chapter 8. You don't need to be worried about Israel. You don't need to be worried about Syria. You don't need to be worried about Assyria. You need to be concerned about me. I'm the Lord your God. Find find your hope. Find find your, your peace. You try to find it everywhere else. It's not going to happen. Now, here, here's why I took you through that. We're going to discuss a lot more the rest of the night. I, I know I got preachy. Chapter 8 screams to us that what we're about to read is because of nothing but grace. I want you to remember this backdrop as we read the descriptive words of God here in just a minute. What in the world did Israel do to deserve what we're about to read? Okay. All right. Now let's have some fun. Uh, Can I have somebody read for us chapter 9, verses 1 through 7? There will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Thou shalt multiply the nation. Thou shalt increase their gladness. They will be glad in thy presence as with the gladness of harvest. 
as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou shalt break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulder, the rod of their oppressors as, it, as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult, a cloak rolled in blood will be for burning fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of the peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it into a world of justice and righteousness, righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Okay. Um, December of this year, this will be our sermon. Um, so you're getting about a, a 20 minute preview, I guess. <laughs> um, but we're going to spend more time tonight than we would in the, in the sermon time later on the first three or four verses. Um, first thing I want you to note is how Isaiah is speaking. Um, not just the words that he's saying, but how he's saying it. And, and this, this is a commonality that we'll continue to discover as we unpack uh, Isaiah's messianic prophecies. Isaiah is speaking in a prophetic, perfect voice. He is speaking as if it is already done. Why? Because there's no doubt it will be done. Absolutely. In God's mind, it's as if it is. Because remember, we exist on a timeline. God looks down on time. So from his perspective, this is, this is done. In God's mind, this has already happened. Now, do you think it was God's eternal plan from the beginning that He already had in mind that you know bring a Savior? Of course, of course, of course. Now, He tells us that in the moment of distress. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali previously uh, have been humbled. This is where the Assyrians started their invasion and their eventual conquest. It was from the Jezreel Valley to Mount Hermon. Um, the Jordan River flows through this eventually to the Sea of Galilee. Um, that will come into play um, as a big deal here in just a minute. This area uh, was called the Galilee of the Gentiles or the Galilee of the nations. Um, the rest of the world tended to look down on this area as not particularly spiritual, as not particularly pure. Where did Jesus initiate his ministry? Okay. Right around here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, he says there's going to be rejoicing over the harvest. What does he mean by that, and why would you rejoice over a harvest? Well, that happens your food, that your blessings. Yeah, I mean, exactly, exactly. Your sustenance is the better word. But you you put a lot in, and now your blessing has come. Your sustenance has come. Your provision has come. And, and this is a big, big payoff. Now, there are several times in Scripture that the coming of the Lord is referred to as harvest time. This, this is the time when your sustenance has come. This is the time when your ultimate blessing has come. So you see the fruits of your labor. Yeah, yeah. Like when you go to heaven, yeah. your labor. Absolutely, absolutely. Spot on, spot on. Now, he also makes reference in this passage to Midian's defeat in verse 4. All right. I remember, I hope you remember Midian's defeat because we talked about it in this class about two months ago. Y'all remember who might have led Midian's defeat? His name started with a G. 
and he was a judge. And he was timid at first, but then he became strong and courageous. But he wasn't Joshua. <laughs> Gideon. 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 Okay. So um, remember that Midian's defeat would have been by any any measuring human measuring stick was like the ultimate upset. Three hundred people don't defeat hundreds of thousands of soldiers unless God's on your side. Right. Okay. So. The, just to contextualize this uh, this idea. Um, so, verse 5 says, Every warrior's battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning and will be fuel for the fire. Oh, from a worldly standpoint, does it seem like that's happened yet? See your crane. Okay. From a from a purely human standpoint, um, this day is still coming. But in the context of a prince of peace, maybe it's here. All right, there's another thought to hold on to. What does Isaiah mean when he says the government is going to be on the child's shoulders? The government's going to be on his shoulders. Eternal judgment is going to rest there. Okay, it's going to rest on him. Okay. And it's going to be a different kind of kingdom. Okay. Um, and God is going to accomplish all this through the birth of a child. And this is going to be the mind-boggling part to them. Because you, you don't deal with Assyria with a child. You don't deal with your enemies with a child. But you've got in chapter 7, the child is the sign that Judas should trust in God. Chapter 8, the birth of a child is a further validation that Judas should trust in God. In chapter 9, which the long-term fulfillment of Emmanuel shows that even when God's own people reject him, God is still going to ultimately be victorious all through a child. Only the mind of God would come up with the idea that the way you deal with oppression and hostility and vulgarity, vulgarity and ultimate warriors and all that sort of stuff, the, the way you defeat that's with a child. That's what God does, because he's God, okay? For us, a child is born to us, a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders. And here's the, de here's the description that we all love uh, so very much. And uh, the end of verse, end of verse six, uh, these eight words, um, they are character descriptions intended to give a little glimpse of the nature uh, of the significance of God. Um, historically, Egypt was notorious for giving their rulers eight different titles. Um, I should have written some of them down. Um, Ramses, the this, the this, the this, the this, the this, all descriptive words of his so-called might and power. Um, God doesn't need that. But can you imagine trying to put these words to adequately describe what God is doing here? We're going to look at these words, and we're going to look at their power. We're going to look at what they mean, and it's still not going to feel sufficient. Does that make sense? Um, all right. What do you What do you think of when you think of wonderful counselor? Wisdom. Wisdom. Okay. Absolutely. Anything else? Good listener. 
Listen, listener, okay? Experienced. Experienced. Truthful. Truthful. Gonna gonna tell you gonna tell you the truth even if it might hurt a little bit. Okay. Wise. All right. Wisdom. Good, good Mary. Wisdom. Absolutely. Absolutely. All loving. Okay. There. Uh, it, if it's not motivated out of love, absolutely. That's going to be a huge part of this, Jack. Absolutely. Um. All right. So. I see a hand. Yeah. Who am I missing? Uh, Casey. You got your muted, sweet Casey. I can hear you. Push your magic button. <laughs> Come on, cooperate with her. There you go. Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. He gives the right advice. Every time. Every time. Um, I, w I would not want us to raise our hands and testify about all the wrong advice we've received in our lives. Mm. Um, his advice is on every time. Now, now each of these descriptions has a permanent title and a variable description. So you've got wonderful, mighty, everlasting, and peace are the variables. You've got counselor, God, father, and prince are the permanent titles. All right, this is going to come back to you, Marie. Pele Yohets. I'm probably not pronouncing that particularly well. Pele Yohets is the um, Hebrew for wonderful counselor. Hmm. Um, in your oldest Bibles, you will have a comma between wonderful and counselor. Isaiah really didn't do that. And you find further proof of that in Isaiah 28, that wonderful and counselor belong together, okay? Pele is the word for wonderful. That's why I said, think about the greatest soccer player of all time. Okay, now, wonderful, because of our limited vocabulary, um, can be used in a lot of, a lot of ways. But in the Old Testament, every time the word wonderful was used, it was only in either direct or indirect connection to God. You never described anything about a regular old human being as wonderful. You use that particular, you use Pele in some context of when you're talking, having a God discussion. Um, because you're talking about extraordinary, you're talking about surpassing. You're talking about supernatural abilities. You're talking about the things that only God uh, can do. Um, so when you think about it that way, you think about his birth it is certainly wonderful because it's something only God could do. The way he lived his life is wonderful because it's something only God could do. Um, his miracles... Uh, the, legitimacy, the legitimacy of them, raising Lazarus from the dead, um, his resurrection, his return, those things that God can do. He's wonderful. He's beyond um, our ability to grasp in that way. Uh, we got the counselor part, uh, the one who comes alongside with wisdom, with good advice, it could have been a military strategist. It could have been a lawyer. Um, either way. Um, do you see how Isaiah is leaning into that, uh, or God is, through Isaiah? Especially when, you remember when we were reading at the end of chapter 8 about all these mediums and spiritists and basically palm readers? Oh, you don't need that. <laughs> you got God to counsel you. Come on. Right. Okay? So, so a wonderful... Uh, counselor. All right. Now, what makes Jesus so wonderful as a in in the role of counselor? What makes him the best counselor in human history? I would say compassion. That's a great one, Mary. His compassion, because what he does flows from his compassion. That's great. He loves us. He knows each of our names. 
Okay, so so there, there's two levels to that. I'm going to come right back to you. Um, there's two levels to that. He knows my name. That means he knows everything about me. And he knows your name. He knows everything about you. So when he's counseling me, he not, and, and if I'm dealing with something with Jenny, he not only knows everything about me, he knows everything about Jenny. Um, you don't get better counsel. You don't get better counsel than that because he knows our names. That, that was awesome. What were you saying, Jack? I was saying his com complete perfection, his perfectness. He's yeah. Free from, from sin, totally. <coughs> because what he's going to give you is 100% pure. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, he can give you. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's an emotional. Uh, it's, it's, it, it, he, he has that emotion. He cares. Yeah. Whereas a lot of times, you know, a counselor is just someone to kind of go through the motions, but this is, okay, yeah. this is something that's different. He, he's not standing back and observing. He's in it for your good. Um, Paul said he is for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? That's great. Yeah. Go, my, my on. go ahead, brother. There's one thing about that word counselor. That means that he is someone you can go to, you can Absolutely. listen to, and all of his counsel in the whole wide world is not going to do any good unless you listen and follow through. And that cool. word is there to show us the lesson we should be learning is a disaster. There was in Israel, Judah, and the whole situation was there was they did not listen. Mm -hmm. They had a wonderful, all-powerful, all-loving counselor, but they did not listen. And all the times that Jesus contacted them, he said, if. Sure. And that's what <laughs> he said to us. Sure. sure. And unless we are listening, Unless we are living it, God's not going to bless us. He's going to discipline us so that we will understand we don't have the answers because we don't listen. We don't have because we don't ask. Because, because, of, the, because of that fatherly nature that he has. Um, Irvon, that's so wise. That's so wise. Um, he is a mighty God. Uh, the Hebrew for mighty God is El Gibor. Um, literally translated, this means mighty, mighty. Okay? Because the El part of Elohim, Elohim is, one of, is the original Genesis 1-1 in the beginning, Elohim. All right? A lot of places shortened to El throughout the Old Testament. Okay? So there's might there in the L, and then there's might in the Gibor. So it's like it's like double. It's more than double, but it's a it's a <coughs> emphasis on his might. Um, so the outflow of that is there's going to be no limits on his wisdom. There's going to be no limits on his power. There's going to be no limits on his capacity to love. That means every problem, there's going to be no problem that he can't solve. There's not going to be any obstacle he can't overcome. There's going to be no sickness that he can't heal. And through Christ, through this Emmanuel, there's going to be no sin greater than his ability to forgive. Um, so you've got the might, and then you've got the divinity of God. So mighty God is also is also making it very clear, God with us, God God in flesh is coming, okay? Um, now, since, since we talked about no limits on this, no limits on that, what kind of limits do we tend to put on God? He doesn't really care about us. Yeah, hey. Don't really care about us. We've got a whole world to watch after. Here I am this little old speck over here in Jacksonville, Florida, halfway in the ocean. He doesn't have time for me. Um, yeah, it's definitely a way we limit God. 
We look for immediate answers and results. Oh man, Gary. Uh, it's as if he hadn't, if he didn't do it by yesterday, he's somehow not capable or unwilling. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and these are all big problems when we think about our relationship with God. We have expectations that, and, you know, God, God can fulfill those expectations if he so desires to do that. But that's not how he operates. So it's, we have to be careful how we think of God. And, and, and not, to, not to put him in our little container and, right. tell, and, and tell him what he is going to do or tell him what he's not going to do or how he's going to do it or certainly not that he owes us anything. Right. Right here. Well, we, we, see, we can only see the world from where we are. Sure. That's it with our human eyes and our human brain. And I think we tend to put God in that same, like you're talking about, in that box and not realize that he sees huh, the big picture, so to speak. He sees everything. Yeah, absolutely, Sherry, absolutely. He's a wonderful counselor. He's a mighty God. He's Paleo Heads. He's El Gibor. And he is the everlasting or eternal father. Uh, Abi, I. When you see that word Abi, capital A with a V I, Abi, um, does that bring a thought into your mind when we're talking about a father? Abba. Abba. I think of Abba, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Abba, father. Or Abba. That, that term of endearment, of nearness, uh, of closeness. So you've got, you've got this Abba, this Papa, and you've got everlasting, which means unceasing in duration. They're timeless. Right? Um, an uncreated one. So he exists before time, and he exists when time is over. Now, here's where it gets in interesting, as if it hadn't been interesting so far. Um, in Second Samuel... Um, the text says God is going to be the, God is basically to the king uh, or the kings of Israel. God is to be like their father and the kings as if they are his son. Here in Isaiah, the son is called everlasting father. So the Lord, who was always, um, who always chose and enthroned the Davidic kings, he's coming to rule as Messiah. So he's both the sender of Messiah and Messiah because he's one. Does that make your head hurt? <laughs> that makes my head hurt because... We, we, find, we, we come to discover as we continue to study text, he is a triune God. But uh, Jesus himself says in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. Yeah. That means he, saw, he was sovereign before this event, and he is sovereign through all eternity. And through all of that, he chooses to relate to us like a papa like like a dad like a daddy um, now another element of that is because he's my Abba and he's your Abba for all of those all of us who have put our faith and trust in him that brings our fraternal relationships into play as brothers and sisters okay so he is Pele Yohetz El Gibor, Abi Ad, and then we kind of finish where we started, Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. Um, Sar means a head person. It means captain. It means governor. It means the person who is in charge. 
Um, when you see that SAR, you may you may find from it um, the Romans called it Caesar. The Russians called called it Czar, C Z A R. It's the same root from the word. Oh. Okay, it's the head person, it's the captain, it's the person in charge, the head over all. So in this context, he's the head, the governor, the cap, the the one who's ultimately ensuring peace. The prince who brings peace. Hence, every time in the Old Testament, when you see a theophany, you see an angel or you see a pre-incarnate Christ, when they show up and everybody's freaked out, they usually start by saying peace. That's why. Now, you all know this, but, but just, to, just to drill down, the Hebrew mind never thought about peace as the absence of war. And the Hebrews never thought about peace as people negotiating with each other to come to mutual best interest. To them, peace was a condition through which all things kind of followed their destiny undisturbed. Um, hence, John, Jesus says in John 14, uh, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as what? The world, the world. gives. <laughs> okay. that, now, here's why this matters. Jesus did not come to resolve nation against nation conflict. That's not Prince of Peace. He comes to bring peace between us and God through his redemption by his death and resurrection. So we have this kingdom within us and because we have this kingdom within us, <coughs> we have peace right now. Mm. We should mm. have peace right now. When Jesus says he's the prince, when, the, when this text says prince of peace, it's not something you, you obtain by getting rid of a stressor in your life. It's something that you bring into your life. Um, because this peace is the peace that lasts forever. The zeal of the Lord is going to accomplish this. It says that means his love is flaring up to fulfill his promises. So here's the conclusions we draw. God was not abandoning his people for disaster, even though they deserved it. He's promising them that in spite of what was happening in the moment, they have a glorious future ahead. The transcendent becomes one of the created. The sinless one takes on our sin. The infinite becomes finite. The immortal experiences mortality. Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, the resurrection is proof that that promise is for us. Now, last thought. The government will be on his shoulders. The ultimate question we have to deal with is has the king of kings taken over government of our lives? Only then do we know only then do we really fully experience God with us. So I hope you've been able to see that there's a, there's a, an immediate fulfillment of Emmanuel. There, there's a, a fulfillment of Emmanuel when Jesus is born 2,000 years ago. There is an ongoing fulfillment of Emmanuel as he rules and reigns in our hearts and in our lives. Um, 
There is more to this in Isaiah 11, and we'll get to Isaiah 11 next week. All right. You all still have your eyes open, so. All right. If you want to say something, you look like you're, you're stewing. As I've been sitting here listening to this, another passage came in my mind. And to me, all of this that we've talked about in the world, to me, personally, is wrapped up in I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Mm -hmm. We're either in there with him, or we're out of it. We're in his face, or we're in his face, or we're in his face. And it's not, and no, there's only one way it's all going to yeah, work. There's only one way. And I guess that's what this is coming Absolutely. Absolutely. Jack. And, and Mike, do, do we not share that peace? Don't we share that peace with those who are needy in whatever way? I, I hope so. I hope we are sharing peace, passing that as we go along. Uh, you talk about a peace within us. We need to be ready to share. Uh, I'll, I will tell you all this. I'm going to talk about somebody on their back. Um, last night we were sitting at supper. And um, we, were, we, were, we were explaining to um, Hannah how difficult things are with Della right now. And Hannah goes... After just, you know, we're praying for and everything. Anna says, I just want to be like her because she just comes into a room and the room lights up. Everybody just feels good in her presence because she just makes it seem like everything is, is okay. And, and how my 13 year old girl came to that conclusion, I'll, I'll, I just, that's between her and God. <laughs> but um, you know, you need to tell you talk, her Oh yeah, that that time's coming. And she wakes up. Yeah, that time's coming. But just this idea of being filled with this peace because of what we have seen tonight, and taking that peace with us wherever we go, has a profound impact. Amen. So it, it, that's incumbent upon us. Um, let's pray before I cry. Chip, can you lead us in prayer, please, sir? <laughs> Father, we thank you for peace. We thank you for the relationship that you have offered us, which is what we were created to be in. Father, we ask that you would heal Della and David you would return them to us. We know that all them both in your hands. We ask that you would keep them safe. They would return to us very soon. In Jesus' name. Thank you all so much for tonight. Y'all hung through a lot of work training. Thank you all so much. Thank you all. Have a good rest of the week. Thank you, everybody online. Appreciate y'all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.